Chairman of Geopolitical Futures, a company dedicated to forecasting the course of the international system. And our special guest today is George Friedman, who last uh, time we had George on, we were talking about COVID. I don't know if you remember that, George, and whether it would be a, uh, or to what degree a threat it would be. And in my own mind, no one really had an idea that it would be as bad as it would. So for our listeners who have not heard of you right now, we're going live on our YouTube channel, The Financial Quarterback, and on iHeartRadio, Spotify, now on Anchor.fm, also uh, wherever podcasts are, Apple, Google Play. George Friedman, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about what got, uh, got you started in the financial industry, uh, kind of forecasting geopolitical events and your background for people who are not familiar with your work? Well, I have an academic background, a PhD in government, and I've done work for the government and I've done work for corporations, but my core interest is geopolitics. And geopolitics is the, nation, the relationship between nations. Finance, from my point of view, is a subset of geopolitics because what happens within the political system help shape the economy and vice versa. So my real interest is the way the world is working, the tensions that exist in the world, uh, the way in which economics causes political and military pressures, and so on. So I deal with blood and guts. Uh, you guys deal with money. Blood and guts. So let's talk about the blood and guts. What about the blood and guts of the world events, let's do COVID, then we'll get to Israeli-Palestinian relationships. What about blood and guts? What's going on? Well, COVID was a significant event. Uh, whether it has lasting effect really depends on something that's going on right now. We were all expecting the major problem, economic problem of COVID to be happening during the COVID crisis or in something the government does. What's happening right now worldwide are shortages, shortages that most people didn't anticipate. Uh, there's a shortage in steel. Of course, there's a shortage of microchips. There's a shortage of sugar. Uh, there's a shortage of chlorine. There's a shortage of many things. So we expected it possible that the economic system would break down during the crisis. What seems to be happening is that it broke down afterwards or is tending toward breaking down. Uh, the reasons are many. Uh, one of them is that uh, social distancing really undermined the workforce and what work could be done. And a lot of workers just aren't there. It's not just a question of uh, government uh, subsidizing workers not to work. It's also a question that after a year, people have to get other jobs. They did get other jobs. They started businesses, they did all sorts of things. So they're no longer available. And the biggest problem is in the trucking industry. Uh, they are way short of truck drivers. It normally takes about two months to get uh, certified as a truck driver. That's now up to six months and growing uh, because there are very few instructors. So what's happened is that in the aftermath of the virus, as demand picked up, the system wasn't ready to provide it. Now, hopefully, we're going to be able to get out of this pretty soon. Uh, it's just will pick up, but there's no evidence that's happening. I went to the supermarket today, and I was buying some stuff, and I noticed that there was no sugar, no sugar at all on the shelves. And sugar products like soda weren't available. So where I think we really have to look is whether or not we can climb out of these shortages repair the system, reallocate labor, and move forward. Because right now, the situation is getting worse, not just here, but in Europe as well. I suspect in China, but who can tell with them, okay? It's a serious issue. No, that's fantastic. So what do we do, a fantastic insight here from George Friedman. If you're not familiar with his work, you should be. Uh, we'll talk about his latest book as well. I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. And folks, uh, if, you, if you're just new to his work, uh, you, will, you will love 
his insightful commentary. So George, so what do you think is going to happen? I mean, we have like chlorine shortages. Is that because all these people are, you know, building pools? Why is there a chlorine shortage? Well, there are not enough workers to produce it, not enough trucks to transport it, and downstream from it, the other suppliers of components of chlorine, things of that sort, uh, they're not available to do it. We have a general, um, the system changed to accommodate the virus. It cut back on all sorts of deliveries and so on. Now it's, it's readjusting is difficult. So just as you always say the marketplace suggests, it did. And now it's trying to come out of it and it's having the usual problems. If I were to bet, I would bet that in the United States we would solve it fairly quickly, in Europe a little longer. But that's a bet because I don't really understand. It's very hard to get a grasp of the vastness of the supply chain and the injuries that were done to it by COVID. Is, do you think this could create some type of economic meltdown? All these shortages, like in well, chips? Um, I'll, I'll... Well, I mean, if, if we're short of everything, sure. I mean but we're not there yet. I mean, there's plenty of goods and services there, but in certain industries, steel, for example, there's a steel shortage. Much of it comes internationally, much of it comes by ship, and uh, we, we don't have enough. So could it create one? Well, yeah, sure, if we don't solve the problem, and if it gets worse, or even if it stays the same, it's gonna be a tremendous hit on the economy. My assumption is that the marketplace will straighten itself out. There are opportunities out there if you figure out how to transport something, opportunities, if you have products in shortage, there are a lot of opportunities. And my expectation is that entrepreneurs everywhere are trying to figure out how to make some money off of this. So my bet would be that in the United States, we'll pull out of this in a month or two. In Europe, where the regulations are more intense and the tradition of making do is not recent, they may have more trouble. They're having a lot of trouble with their economy. But from my point of view, you know, you can be very worried about the government spending and everything else, but I'm focused in on what is a geopolitical issue, uh, shortages all over the spectrum and how quickly we can get over those. I'm most worried about the semiconductor shortage and what's going on with Taiwan. Uh, what concerns do you have about that? And explain the problem for our listeners who aren't aware of it. Well, there are many explanations for it, but this is one of many components that are missing from the system. It just has to be one that's been noticed because immediately it's knock on effect in the auto industry was noticed. I'm most c concerned about food. Uh, the transportation of food, uh, it's packaging, it's management. All of this is critical. And so I'll argue that, yeah, we've all noticed the semiconductor issue and now take that over into a series of household products, necessary household products, and you'll see what I'm worried about. So if something like the semiconductor problem presents itself on a range of essential consumables in the home, now we got a revolution because that will be absolutely explosive. So we already see it, where we put it, we already see that in the semiconductor industry. We see its effect on the auto industry. We see the effect of the auto industry slow down on other things. Let's just take a look at the whole spectrum It's happening. Oh, good, good. So you don't, you're not that worried about the semiconductor shortage? What I'm, I'm worried about all the shortages because yes, I'm worried about the semiconductor shortage. I'm worried about it because it can stop the production of critical uh, entities and employ people. I just look around and see all of these as scary. I mean, the shortage of chlorine has a real significance for the water supply. And <laughs> there you have a problem. So you can't, all of these have their own unique difficulties and all of these have their own unique significance. But the one that's getting the headline uh, is not the only one that should be there. And where do you see a food shortage affecting Americans most quickly? I mean, we saw it like a year ago, there was no beef. <laughs> um, where, where, where's the food shortage now? Or where's that potentiality of a problem? 
Well, we're moving into the planning system. It's uh, the planning season. And in order to plant, you have to have fertilizer. You have to have the seeds to go there. You have to have the gasoline to power the tractors and everything else. So the first place we're going to, the problem is, are we going to, what kind of crop are we going to have this year in food? Uh, we have a gasoline shortage. We know that. Here in Texas, I'm sure the lads in Houston are going to be pumping away to get it where it has to go. But having the gasoline shortage is not only the hack, it's the broader issue. And so you look at the question of, you know, how are you going to plant if you have a gasoline question, gasoline shortage? How are you going to take the food to the processor? How is any of this going to happen? So each one of these shortages, especially on strategic commodities, poses a problem. Oh, fantastic. We're with George Friedman. George's daily writings, which are very insightful, can be found at geopoliticalfutures.com. Geopolitical Futures is a subscription-based online publication that analyzes and predicts global events and what really matters in the world in an objective way. And folks, if you call us within the next three minutes, I will throw in George's latest book. My, oh my, this was written before COVID and it proved prescient. Uh, the Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s and the Triumph Beyond. Excellent book. We will give away the first three copies to those of you who schedule and keep a no obligation review with us. So call us now, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674, 888-988-JOSH, and we'll be back after these messages. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, reminding you pick up George's book, The Storm Before the Calm, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s. We interviewed George February of last year, and little did we know how bad COVID would. We talked about how it may be very bad, but I'm sure we didn't have any full realization of how bad it truly would become. So get that book, call us 888-988-JOSH when you schedule and keep your no obligation review. George, do you have any idea? Do you remember that interview in February? It, it was like COVID was like a worry, but it wasn't nearly the worry it became. When did, well, take, take us through last year, when did it become, I mean, you were worried about it, we, we talked about it, but then it just became, you know, hell. <laughs> so when did that change for you? Take us through, our interview I think was early February, and then obviously we all know what happened the year after. Uh, what happened with you during that period? Well, my book was published on February 25th. That was the day before everything started to shut down. Do not publish a book the day before the world shuts down. I mean, all my interviews were shot and everything else uh, because it was shutting down and my book tour was shut down. I was supposed to go to Seattle and there was a tremendous, it was just a mess. I had no oh, idea I what it was going to become. Got a ton of book because we had you on right before, and people would be like, "Oh, this guy is so prescient," but no, it it hurts you. Well, oh, darn. Well, basic basically, what was funny was that um, a whole bunch of TV shows really didn't have time to do book reviews. They were trying to look at the apocalypse, but that was fine. And where it really started to hurt was in March. We didn't understand what was going on. We didn't understand how to fight it. And we put in place, in Feb really in March, the solution, the only one that anybody could think of, everybody stay home and hide. Uh, it wasn't even masks. It was like a twilight zone thing. Everybody go home. So it wasn't poorly meant or anything like that. It was just the only thing they could think of. And the numbers kept walking, rising and the fear kept rising. And then we came to the bifurcation of American society. There were those who could work home from home and Zoom, okay, which were generally managerial, uh, professional, so on and so forth. 
and those who actually had to lift the boxes that would come into our stores. They couldn't stay home. They were ordered to stay home. And that's when the whole system started to break down. Nobody wanted to consider the consequences of this. Yes, there was a virus. Yes, it was dangerous. Yes, masks helped. Yes, social distancing is a good idea. But what the consequences were, nobody could really understand. Because when you're in a crisis, you're in a fire, you don't worry about what happened to your flooring. So everybody started doing it. It was March and April and May because we wound up in a period where we did have no idea when this would end or if it would end. We were really not sure how dangerous the disease was, but everybody was kind of hovering back. Things were shutting down. And in that process, many of us found new ways to work. And a lot of people's lives are devastated. Uh, the guys who were laying the bricks couldn't lay the bricks. Uh, in Austin, over here, uh, whole buildings that were being built stopped being built. It was a very hard time. And then we got into the summer and the anger started. They wanted a better solution or to take the risk of something else. And then the government kind of arrayed itself as a mentor and they resisted it. And some parts of the country as in Texas were in revolt against the rules. Other parts of the country were dramatically defensive. Uh, we had a breakdown in the way our civilization was working. And until now that has been the case. The mask turned into amazingly an ideological uh, symbol. It became something that the left insisted that you wear and the right refused to wear. And you got caught up in that. And we got caught up in many of these side issues, but essentially the medical establishment did not know how to deal with the fact that the cures they were suggesting had consequences that they didn't anticipate. If you keep a five year old or a four year old child from playing with other children, uh, getting into fights, do all those things. And you do that. You've taken some critical years of development out of their lives and you don't know what they're going to turn out to be. These sorts of things seem trivial in the face of the fact we were saving their lives. Were they or were they not? And this is where we went to. So we're coming out of this right now with a tremendous amount of bitterness on both sides. Uh, the left wearing masks is a sign of virtue. Uh, this right not wearing them is a sign of liberation. And the question is, is this a new line we've drawn our society? But as I said before, before we get to that question, we have to total up the impact of all the different solutions that are what it had on society, all the different solutions, what it, the impact it had on the economy. Um, we have to understand what's happened. We haven't done a post-mortem yet. And in that post-mortem, we're going to get surprises as to what happened. Geopolitically, this is just something that I see. I see homeschooling as a revolution in the U.S. that goes from sort of a fringe thing of, I don't know, 2 to 10 million people to 10 to 30 million. I see a lot of people where uh, homeschooling traditionally was either something on the far left or the far right. You know, hippies did it. There was the whole unschooling movement. Religious conservatives did it. Now, a lot of people are like, I mean, we homeschool our children and we have parents coming to us saying, man, how do you do it? Uh, it's interesting. Some are repelled from the idea of homeschooling because they think sitting your kid in front of a TV screen is homeschooling. It has nothing to do with homeschooling. Uh, so they, they like, oh, they, they're repulsed by it. Others say, wow, your kids, like our kids, they didn't go through any of this COVID mental abuse that children went through. We still had homeschool cooperatives. Kids played outside. They socially distanced uh, during the brunt, but they still played with their friends every week. They had homeschool cooperatives. And it was funny, the, the knock used to be, oh, homeschoolers are more, uh, you know, antisocial. And now it's the public school kids who are more antisocial because they're locked in front of their screens and they're in a bubble and they have half days and all these other kinds of weird things. Have you done any research on sort of homeschooling as a 
phenomenon geopolitically? Because I think that'll have some major repercussions, probably not now, but like from a society, maybe 10, 20 years from now. What say you? We had, yeah, we had to look at the homeschooling as you did it was an organized process. You had materials to teach with. You had opportunities to be trained in some of the things you did at home. And most important, it was not the kids staying at home. I'm sure your kids, as you said, played with other kids. There was playtime. Exactly. Plenty of opportunity for them to have a fist fight and everything else that a child has to have. The homeschooling that happened here was children staying at home. If they had a computer, watching by computer, if not, there was nothing, with parents had really no idea how to help them, and missing the element that I regard as the essence of traditional homeschooling, playtime. You made certain that your kids got together, made friends, had enemies, the, the whole ball of wax. Yeah, no, the what's going and, on... That's, that's a great point. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm yeah, enjoying in this. Any, in what, what you're looking here at any other this things that are happening in schools, that's not anything like homeschooling. Exactly. That's no, a no. Really important because we talk to our parents, our friends, neighbors who say, oh, I could never do homeschooling. Well, well, we're like, that isn't real homeschooling. That's the furthest thing. That's like some weird, uh, almost like schooling of the matrix where kids have to be in front of a screen for eight hours. It's like, it was almost like the ultimate I don't, child abuse, but go ahead. I don't mind that as much as these kids have to play outside. Mm. Aside from the vitamin D, they have to play outside. Deaths in children are minuscule from this disease. And we have kept these kids in many places out of that. Uh, my children, my grandchildren, my children's children, were, of course, the schools were closed, but they were taken to places where other kids were to play and you took whatever risk had to be taken. It was minor. But the important thing about what's happened here is social development, which home, traditional homeschooling emphasizes. Social development was completely discarded. The teachers' unions were absolutely obsessed with the health issue, reasonable to be obsessed, but they gave very little thought to something the, help, the homeschoolers always thought of, how do I make this kid grow up and to be a man or a woman or what have you? Okay. Yeah, we, we were making steps. How do we get our kids with other kids without like traumatizing them through this period? So we still had them play soccer. We still, I mean, there was that period from let's say March to June or where we didn't do as much, but by summer kids were playing soccer again. And even in yeah. April and May of last year, we made them go play time, get it, get outside, get some vitamin D. And all those things matter. And read a book outside, well, you also, do something outside. You also had, all this is great. You also, had, you also had material at home meant for the child being schooled at home. Because uh, I know that the home schooling ch programs have a great deal of material for each grade. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, we, so have, they were, we have some amazing curriculums and a lot of them yeah. don't rely on sitting the kids in front of a screen. It's books. No, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. You didn't have to do that. You knew what you were doing. Now you were dealing with a bunch of parents who had no idea what they're doing, no access to the material, only fear. Yeah. And that really worries me in what's going to happen in two, three years with these kids when they get into schools with kids who are socialized and they don't know how to make friends. The other thing is that I'm noticing too, because kids got, you know, let's say soccer, kids got slower, kids got a little unhealthier. Um, I wonder what the, the health repercussions will be, you know. I also worry about the psychologically. They were taught at an early age that the outdoors is dangerous, right? Mm. Uh, to be extremely careful, to be watchful. Instead of becoming kids who grew up in the outdoors, if even in a city environment, I worry about what the consequences are going to be psychologically to a group of children, of generation almost, 
that is uncomfortable with the outside. That that's that that worries me. Now we're going to be looking at this. I want to point out when you look at COVID, it's the after effects that are going to be the most startling, like the shortages, like children that are maladjusted to the outdoors and things like that. We haven't yet begun to total up the cost of this. Mm. And I think the solution is pa- parents and grandparents, just take your kids outside, go for a walk, go for a bike ride. Uh, we would just walk around the neighborhood, go for a bike ride. Oh, we opened the pool a little early last summer. That reminds me, I gotta get the pool people to open up this summer. We check if it, check if they have chlorine. I know. Well, yeah, you're, yeah, they may not have any chlorine. So, with that, we'll take our next uh, break of the hour. And folks, uh, we will buy you a copy of the Storm Before the Calm America's Discord and the coming crisis of the 2020s and the triumph beyond. Wow, that title was like, uh, it was, it was uh, telling the future before COVID even happened. So call us folks, 888-988-JOSH if you wanna keep your no obligation review, 888-988-JOSH. And we will throw in a copy of the book by special guest George Friedman of Geopolitical Futures. Call us now, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674. And YouTube, you can ask any question on the chat, 888-988-JOSH. We'll be back after these messages. And we're back with George Friedman of Geopolitical Futures. So George, we got a lot to talk about. We got a, I got a whole series of questions I didn't even get to yet. So what are your thoughts on the global economy as the vaccine effort continues and we approach the coveted herd immunity? And how is that affecting U.S. Well, recovery? You mentioned shortages of everything, uh, but any other things on the vaccine effort or COVID in general? Well, I mean, it's we've had the virus. We're coming out of it. Hopefully the shortages will disappear. Okay. We spent, all countries have spent enormous amounts of money uh, maintaining society during a period of massive dysfunction. This resembles nothing as much as war. In wartime, you have a massive diversion of resources to other things than the economy. So in World War II, a massive diversion of production to war. Okay. You wound up after World War I in a big depression for the same reason. Mm-hmm. In World War II, uh, you wound up at a great boom. It all depends how you spend it. So right now, think uh, it's very useful to us at least to think of us as a war is over, we're all coming back home, we're all dancing that is good, and now we get down to the business of restructuring our economy. I think the government needs to support, I think they spent way too much money during the COVID thing to keep things going. I think that was poorly spent. They're gonna need to spend money now. There's gonna have to be some borrowing to get the economy stabilized just as after World War II that happened. Uh, And I think you have to be very careful not to give too much because then you basically cause the economy to depend on that input. So. At this point, you know, the government's, you know, it's a political issue. Hopefully, at some point, they'll settle down to something coherent. But right now, my concern is that the Europeans are not going to stimulate their economy. The Germans have a rule against stimulation, in effect, and that's going to hold in the EU. Will they break that? Will they change it? Well, we'll see. The Chinese have been stimulating like crazy, and there's going to be costs for that and they're preparing for it. So global economy is going th- going to go through a period of post-war reconstruction and in that period a lot of problems are going to occur and a lot of stress is going to happen. It's not going to be just a question okay we'll go back snap back the way we were. One of the things the shortage is showing is no you're not. You're not going to snap back. You can build your way back but you're not going to snap and that's going to be worldwide. 
but there are opportunities to be had within that, obviously. What about the nine trillion dollars that we've spent thus far? If you add up all the, you know, PPP, you add up the four hundred fifty billion dollar bond ETF bailout, this stimulus package, the fourteen hundred checks, the unemployment extensions. I mean, some estimates say all that we've spent thus far is nine trillion dollars. When does it become the enough, answer, and then we start having yeah. this? Uh, negative effect in the economy because we're overspending. Well, the society panicked during COVID. Much of it got frightened. I know people who today say they were never frightened. These are the same people who I knew panicked after 9-11 and uh, then claimed to have been calm and nothing, nothing big happened. We all panicked. We all didn't know what to do. We were uncertain. And the government panicked with us. They didn't know what to do. Um, they couldn't look like they didn't know what to do, so what they do best is they spent money. Uh, they didn't really stabilize anything, didn't prepare for the solution. We're now in a position of which the shortages are a symptom of a economy which is misaligned. Uh, it's going to take time to work out or the government can stimulate it to work out faster, but they've gotta be much smarter in what they do and we have to be much smarter because there was not a whole lot of opposition from the public to the spending that was being done uh, during the Trump administration. So no, there was one guy, but, Thomas Massey of Kentucky, and the president, uh, President Trump was even cursing the guy out, if you remember. He was the one guy who said, well, let's have a debate about some of this spending. We spent, you know, well, whatever, seven to nine hundred billion during the 08 crisis. Why don't we debate this? And everybody kind of shouted him down and he was. So the answer to, to that was the house was on fire. Yeah. We all felt it. You're not going to sit down and start worrying about how to save this piece of furniture, that piece of furniture. He wasn't wrong. He just misunderstood a reality. This this medical problem caused a misallocation of society. Everybody was lost, everybody was frightened, and he had a perfectly good idea, and he's the kind of guy who inside of a burning building uh, would want to save you know, his goldfish or something. Hmm. So I would argue that we all have to understand how we were then during the virus. Even those who hated Trump, who loved Trump, all of us are sitting here with our mouths hanging open, wondering what in God's name it happened, and demanding that something be done. So one of the problems is not government, it's the public demanding that something be done, which they always do. Government will do something. The only thing they know how to do is spend money. So this is a well-known process, it's, and what happens now is we condemn the people who did it from doing it, for doing it. So they had no you, choice. They had to. So where do you see the U.S. economy headed? I mean, w w could this lead us into some depression because of all the spending and shortages, or, or do we get out of it and we have that post-war boom? Well, what I said at the beginning of the crisis, it can go two ways. It can be a depression. A depression is a financial event, okay? It solves financially. The economy remains capable. A depression is a place where you destroy parts of the economy. Uh, businesses go out of business, can't go back to work, jobs disappear, uh, transportation breaks down, all that, okay? I thought there was gonna be a fine line between depression and recession. I did not expect, that I should have, that the threat of depression would occur after the COVID was solved. Now, from what I see, this is soluble. From what I see, there's lots we don't see of what's going on in the economy. But right now, before everybody starts focusing in on finances and everything else, let's look very carefully at how we solve these, how fast we solve these shortages. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to kind of keep coming back to that, but when I think about an economy, it is something that produces things and consumes things. And out of that comes the financial system. Right now, we're having problems all across the board. No I think we will solve them. Even like what you said with the planters. I, I, I got a text from a buddy of mine 
in upstate New York, in upstate New York, they are trying to hire people for $30 an hour to work on farms and they can't even get people. So well, what, what happened, happened was you've had in six, six months. I mean, I didn't really think about this till that, till this interview. And but think about this two and two together, we're going to have problems with summer tourism, right? You have all these, sure. now that we have a $15 an hour minimum wage, nobody wants to hire kids, pay them $15 an hour. The kids don't want to work. And pretty much every industry that's a summer industry, you know, restaurants, landscapers, whatever, you know, pool companies, everything. People are just, um, yeah, there's a problem there. There's going to be a, a, maybe a societal breakdown. And what's interesting too, is there's like a two phase. There's a boom in those companies that are not reliant on this type of work, you know, like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, the Fang Man. And then there's this other economy that's sort of imploding before our very eyes. So in, in some sense, we could have a stock market boom, right? But a general sort of regular person depression too. Well, you're not going to get a stock market boom if we have general shortages because it's going to affect every company in the world if they can't get the stuff. I don't think that's going to happen, but you can't, you're right in one thing. We experienced the crisis in two different ways. Those of us who had jobs like I have, uh, I can stay home and it works just fine. Okay. Those people who did the work of making chlorine and making uh, the food process products and so on, they can't stay home. They have to be there in the street. Now, what we didn't understand is that these people, when they lost their jobs, didn't go home and wait. They went and found other work. Hmm. Uh, there was a period of extreme formation of small businesses. They traveled to where they had to go. So the workers that some factory expect to come back, they weren't waiting at home for the chance to come back. They shifted somewhere else. And this dislocation is what we're feeling. They're alive, but they've in the year you make another life for yourself. And that sort of wasn't anticipated. So right now, skilled labor that wasn't fully employed, and they had two kids and more they moved. They went to some other place to work and they're not coming back. So that's one of the problems of the shortages. And folks, we're with George Friedman, founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures. You can check out his website, geopoliticalfutures.com. It's a subscription-based online publication to analyze global events and potentially help us see into the future a little bit. So call us now, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674, and you'll get the book, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s and the Triumph Beyond. 888-988-JOSH. 888-988-JOSH. Get it when you schedule your no-obligation review and keep your no-obligation review. 888-988-JOSH. We'll be back after these messages. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with George Friedman of geopoliticalfutures.com. Now, as we move from COVID, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they recently agreed upon a ceasefire. What are your thoughts on the escalation? And we seem to go through the scenario pretty regularly now. Do you feel anything different on how the events unfolded this time around? It was pretty much the routine. There's a couple of differences. The Arab world showed absolute indifference to what was happening to the Palestinians. Some countries, like the United Arab Emirates, uh, condemned uh, Hamas. Uh, major figures in Saudi Arabia did that. So one of the things that happened was that they rarely got much support from the Arab world anyway. In this world, there was kind of this time they were kind of irritated. The only country that was actively supporting Iraq. Uh, Hamas was Iran 
they were giving them missiles, but they weren't giving missiles during the war. So Hamas found itself completely alone. And because of this, you know, people thought this would break apart the, the great coalition that was formed. The great coalition just, you know, relaxed and watched it happen. Netanyahu took this for an opportunity to break Hamas. Break Hamas, not in the sense of driving them into the water or something. Israel does not want to be responsible for Gaza, but imposing a cost on them that hadn't been imposed before. So the first rockets were fired by Hamas. Hamas frequently fires rockets into Israel, pretty ineffective. They don't really touch anything. They're not the missiles they had later. And Israel opened up on them with everything they had, uh, not even sparing AP. How could they do that? Uh, they hit them with everything. So they come out of this situation with shattered any illusion that Hamas can handle Israel gone. Now, Israel, of course, is being universally condemned for this action. Everybody shocked, shocked that they would do this. But having done this and having driven home to Hamas that they're alone, at the very least, Hamas is going to be a long time in trying this again. It gives Israel a freer hand. And it was interesting to watch Biden basically back the Israelis in spite of a lot of pressure from his uh, party. But in the end, he wanted to be the one who appeared to stop the war. He told the Israelis to stop it after they finished, and they did. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not an... Uh, an Israeli-Palestinian experts, I don't claim to be, but one thing I, I found interesting was you, you mentioned Iran supporting Hamas. I also felt the U.S. for the first time, typically the U.S., both the left and the right, typically the U.S., both the left and the right, sort of, they kind of, um, typically those on both sides will back the Israelis. This time I found growing sort of pro-Palestinian sentiment for the first time ever. I think that could be maybe dangerous. I mean, I saw that with, you know, you saw sports figures, Kyrie Irving made a big deal about uh, pa Palestinians. You saw that in uh, various uh, political figures. I don't know what you make of that, but that was one of the first times I've seen that. In the last 30 years. 20 years. 20 years ago, this would have really mattered. It really would have. At this point, Israel is a regional superpower, self dependent on its own technology. The U.S. continues to give them aid. That's more to keep the U.S. on the hook by the Israelis than actually needing it. Uh, he showed that he could because the U.S. also doesn't want to lose Israel's uh, cooperation. Israel is the way the U.S. manages the Middle East. Israel was able to cow some countries into signing this agreement in Israel. So I would argue that, yeah, there is declining support for Israel, also declining need for it. But I think what the Israelis are thinking is that Netanyahu is going to be responsible for taking care of Hamas, then he will face his trial or whatever happens to him go off, and the next prime minister can be very sorry but they were going to take out Hamas finally, no matter what. Interesting. Any other thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Does it get worse or it just pretty much Israel's the superpower and not? Well, think of it this way. We have a coalition now of Arab countries aligned with Israel, hmm. the Abraham Covenant. That's extraordinary that this should happen. Uh, the Palestinians can not count on only one supporter, uh, Iran, and Iran is about to enter into some sort of agreement with the United States. This is going to be some sort of settlement, and not supporting Hamas is undoubtedly going to be a given. So at this point, the Palestinians, for example, didn't rise up in the West Bank. They couldn't. So at this point, you have a situation where Israel is secure. This is also where countries get into trouble when they feel themselves overly secure, and they think they're a superpower, they get hit in the back of the head. But Israel is very cautious, pretty smart in how to handle it. And Hamas had to roll the dice and seems to have lost. What other geopolitical problems do you see uh, ahead in the next year or so that worry you? 
What, well, what sort of keeps well, you up at night? In your analysis? geopolitical problems don't worry me. They delight me. They're my business. Uh, when I look at it, I mean, the China-U.S. standoff is critical. Uh, China is a desperate power. It is an exporting power, it is a trading power, and its entire East Coast is covered by the U.S. Navy. The United States also has a massive anti-Chinese alliance. It starts with Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, Vietnam is part of that, Australia is part of that. Uh, so when you take a look at the, the lineup, the United States has a, has a system of defense that rivaled what we had in NATO. Is that okay? still the case, though? Because there was talk that that sure. was minimized due to Trump or whatever, and he blocked the TPP and all that. Or, or is that, that was just talk? It was just talk. And more to the point, these countries fear China. They all have had experience with China, and they fear them. China, by the way, has only one ally in the world, Pakistan, which is not a very useful ally. So you have a situation of an isolated China, a massive coalition backed by the United States. I once counted up the GDPs of all these countries. China's GDP is $14 billion. This is about $38 trillion. There's a lot of economic power. It's a lot of political power, but it's also a lot of military power. So at some point, China has to to deal with this. One way to deal with this is invade Taiwan. We always talk about that, but invade Taiwan. There's a problem. There are only six amphibious assault craft. Um, they travel at 20 knots. It takes five hours for them to cross. In the meantime, they can be devastating at sea. Plus, the United States can respond either in Taiwan or by closing the Straits of Malacca, where China gets all its oil. And that's right by Singapore, which would cooperate. So China right now is in a very tight box as to what it can do. It has a massive economy, tremendous inequality. It is the second largest economy in the world. But in terms of we'll per capita right income. There, it, and then we'll be back for the exciting conclusion of the interview with George Friedman of Geopolitical Futures. I want to desperately learn more about this, about your take on China-U.S. relations, Taiwan, semiconductor shortage, all that stuff. When we return, this is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Don't touch that dial and call us at 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674. And when you do, you get George's latest book, which I loved. You know, it's a real treat. And it's a shame that the, uh, the, the COVID storm, uh, you know, threw a little damper on your book. But folks, get the book, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s and the Triumph Beyond. Call it, uh, buy it wherever books are sold, Amazon, go to geopoliticalfutures.com, subscribe to his work there, and call me at 888-988-JOSH and get the book free when you schedule and keep your no obligation review. We'll be back after these messages. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. And fastest hour in radio. We got about four short minutes left as we conclude this interview with George Friedman of Geopolitical Futures. And we left off talking about China. If you want to finish that thought, uh, George. China China is the third, second largest economy in the world. Uh, in terms of per capita income, uh, it's the 75th country behind Guyana and Equatorial Guinea. China is an enormously poor country. And when you consider the fact that the coastal region gets most of it, the people living in the interior, 800 million or so, are just impoverished. So it's very important to have a realistic understanding of China. China is a great power. China has a large economy. China has enormous problems. Uh, it does not have a navy more powerful than the American. Uh, it is facing a huge coalition without any allies. So we really have to understand China's strengths and weaknesses, but that's going to be on the table this year because China has to make a move. I suspect it's going to be to negotiate, but we'll see. 
Do you have any faith in the Biden administration to actually show strength to get them to come to the table? Oh, sure. Presidents are like diapers. They get changed all the time. But they do the job. He can negotiate very nicely. So what about, I mean, whatever happened with Tiananmen Square? I mean, maybe I'm just a, an idealist. I, I, I want China to be free. You know, I sort of am like, I, I want us to stand with, you know, the Tiananmen Square people. But, I mean, are they just so beat down by the communists over years and years that they think they're free? Because, I mean, I've talked to some people from there who live here now, live in the U.S. now, and they say, well, our friends back home, they think they're free because that's what the government tells them. They're, they're, they're kind of content, they tell me. I don't know. Have you yeah, researched that at all? Or they not have, really? Sure. They think things are fine. They're Chinese. They think Americans are jokes and not free. So each country holds the other in contempt. Yeah. That's one of the basic things. But they really are something important to understand about them. They're Chinese. What's that thing? They're Chinese. Oh. They're not Americans. Oh, exactly. They don't want to be Americans. Do you think democracy will ever be a thing over there? They think they're democratic. Yeah. They think we're not. And that is they true. think we're not because the rich and the powerful get to dominate what we do. And in China, the public gets a chance to do it. Now, that's not true, but they believe it is. And it's not true that America is dominated by the rich and the powerful. Hmm. But we each have our myths. So they're not going to be like us. They're never going to be like us. They don't want to be like us. Uh, I'll settle for them not starting a war. There you go. That's a great way to conclude. Any parting thoughts, other geopolitical trends that we should be up to date on? Watch Latin America. It's destabilizing. Colombia is destabilized. And it's a place where the Chinese appear to be interested. Of course, they should be. So in Mexico, uh, the Mexican president apologized to China for what he did to Chinese immigrants 100 years ago. So keep your eye on Latin America. What are we doing? What are, what's the U.S. doing with Latin America? Well, we have very close ties with many countries. Uh, they depend on us for trade tremendously. We're doing what we've always done historically, which is maintaining the relations we need. But if you recall the Soviets, they were able to get into Cuba. They were able to operate in Bolivia and other countries over, over time. So this is our backyard, and anybody who's playing against us is going to try to get into that backyard. Have we lost something being so isolationist as a country? I think the... the I don't see how... I don't, I don't see how we're isolationists. We're deeply involved in Asia. We have troops in uh, Poland. Uh, we're, we're just not prepared to fund NATO. You know, these countries... Germany is the third largest economy, fourth largest economy in the world. It can afford its own army. I think uh, supporting some Trump, I mean, he made some very rational moves in saying, look, there's no threat in Europe, and it's time that you defended yourselves and everybody accused of being isolationist. He wasn't isolationist. He was just stating the truth. No, I agree with you there. No, I guess I just see more of a non-interventionalist side of foreign policy on both Democratic and Republican sides lately. And I wonder well, if we... We, we, you know, we fought the Korean War. We fought the Vietnam War. We fought in Iraq. We fought in Afghanistan. You should note that we didn't win any of them. We got a draw in Korea. So the idea that we should constantly be involved in the world depends on defining what is our interest in doing that, what are the risks, what are the rewards. And sometimes they're high and sometimes they're low. So yeah, I think we that. have... I'm more like, I'm still worried about like Venezuela. Like, how did we let that happen? You know, I mean, it, it's just so... Well, well, we could have done what we did in Iraq and invade. No, not an invasion. So the problem, the problem is it's a foreign country. It d develops in its own way. They resent American imperialism. And in the end, it doesn't matter to us what Venezuela does. It just doesn't. So 
it either we are going to be the cops of the world, which was the old traditional approach, or we're going to be very selective. So in the same way we want to be very selective in how we spend money domestically, we need to be very careful on where we spend money and lives overseas. Now, wonderful. And final point, where do you see the U.S. economy heading in the next year besides these shortage issues? Aside from this, it'll recover. It'll surge. And then we'll have a depression, and recession, I should say, and then we'll go. The business cycle will resume, getting past all these shortages. Hmm. When do you see that recession? Eight months, 12 months? Oh, usually, you know, under 10 years, sometimes five years. It's a necessary part of the business cycle. But we're not facing that. We're facing getting over the, the, the destabilizations of COVID and getting the economy started again. Hmm. And it will be done as inefficiently as possible. That's fun. Great, great interview, George Friedman. Thank you so much, folks. Go to geopoliticalfutures.com. Get his book, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 20s and the Triumph Beyond. If you didn't read it, it was a fantastic read. And we will give that book to you for free if you schedule and keep your no-obligation review at 888-988-JOSH. And head over to geopoliticalfutures.com for the best in geopolitical forecasting and thank you so much for a great interview, George. Hope to have you on again in the future. I really enjoyed it, Josh. Thank you. And folks, we'll be back after these messages. Thank you, George. That makes sense? Yeah, I'm stopping. Yep. Just stop the whole YouTube. Then we'll do a second. My wife needs to be back in the Okay. Mm hmm. Josh has to uh, run home real quick. We're going to resume. Okay, great. So just stop and we'll just do another.